Welcome to Never Get It's Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I'm Phyllis Zimbler Miller, the founder of the free nonfiction Holocaust theater project, ThinEdgeTheWedge.com. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and I uh, did not grow up in a Holocaust community. My grandparents came to at the turn of the last century from Latvia and Russia. But in 1970, only 25 years after the end of World War II, my husband and I, he was an army officer, just, uh, were stationed in Munich, Germany. So that was a real shock for us to be there 25 years after the end of World War II. It has impacted our life forever. This podcast is in partnership with Evelyn Marcus, a Dutch Jew who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. She's featured in the documentary, Never Again Is Now, a psychologist she immigrated in 2006 to the United States because of the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. Today, our guest is Lenny Gaitek. Did I say that right or not? Probably not. Uh, close, Gitek. Gitek, even though I practice everyone. Okay. Right. Languages are not my thing. Okay. Lenny has more than 30 years experience as a writer and editor for magazines and newspapers. He is the founder of Project Star of David, a Jewish communications organization, and the publisher and editor of its three websites, antisemitismexposed.org, amazingjews.org, and amazingisraelis.org. Welcome, Lenny. Thank you very much for having me. Our pleasure. Okay, first question. The website of antisemitismexposed.org is about enlightening the world, including the world's Jews, about the past horrors of anti-Semitism, today's frightening surge of Jew hatred and ways we can fight this. When did you start this project and what was the reason you did so? Very briefly, before I answer this, I want to explain to your viewers why I have Band-Aids on my head. Okay. I wish I could say it's because I valiantly, single-handedly fought off a, a gang of anti-Semites. Uh, that's unfortunately didn't happen. It, the, real, the truth is I paid a visit to my dermatologist recently. So having explained that, um, okay. I started all this about two and a half years ago, and there was a very specific precipitating event. I, as I remember, I was watching or listening to uh, either BBC or NPR radio. They were interviewing an Egyptian woman with a PhD, if I remember correctly, and she opined that she knew why Jews don't eat pork because they're the spawn of monkeys and pigs. This is something that I've heard over the years, actually. This is not a one person belief. And uh, I, I'm always amused by it. Of course, I'm outraged, but I'm always amused because she doesn't, I wonder how she explains that uh, Muslims don't eat pork either. Um, but um, the thing I think of immediately is, does she not know that she and her children, and if she has grandchildren or grandchildren, don't have polio because of two Jewish scientists, Salk and Sabin, who both you know, developed uh, right. vaccines. Um, and it just occurred to me that at the time, uh, you know, so many people, including many Jews, don't know the amazing contributions that Jews, about the amazing contributions that Jews have made to the world. And I thought that, I didn't think that was a total answer to anti-Semitism, but I thought it would help. And that's when I started uh, amazingjews.org. Later, I started uh, antisemitismexposed.org. And finally, I did amazingisraelis.org. And uh, altogether, they're, they're really also about fostering Jewish pride which is something that we really need to do among Jews, very importantly. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, I think it's wonderful that you started this and that you didn't just listen to her comments and just say, oh, there it goes again, but you did something. So in your opinion, what are the greatest anti-Semitism challenges that American Jews face today? I think the greatest challenge is in one word, the internet. Because uh, I love the internet, it does wonderful things, but it also unfortunately enables haters of all kinds to spread their, their bile, their hate, instantly with a push of a button all over the world. Um, that's one thing. I think uh, another problem is, you know, we've always had right-wing anti-Semitism, uh, fascist type people, um, white supremacist type people. 
But now a, a major problem is left-wing anti-Semitism. And I think that's even harder to combat than right-wing anti-Semitism. And that's unfortunately been expressed uh, greatly on anti-Semitism on college and university campuses. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I, I, I'll just finish off by saying, I think one problem we have today for all of humanity actually is the complete, what seems like complete chaos and collapse of civilization all over the world. Uh, you know, the violence, the um, violence against women, the mass shootings, the, so uh, 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 global warming, etc. I mean, the list goes on and on. And um, it's hard to keep people focused on the dangers of anti-Semitism when everyone's feeling the world's coming to an end, I guess. Um, and I think it's important to note that anti-Semitism is really, and many people have said this, is sort of the canary in the mine that, uh, you know, it, it, when anti-Semitism rears its own ugly head, eventually it will go beyond hating of Jews. And so it's really a, a, a threat to all of, all people. I very much agree with you that it is a canary in the coal mine. But can we go back for a minute and, and could you tell us why you think left-wing anti-Semitism is harder to combat than right-wing anti-Semitism? I'm curious. Well, because um, a lot of the things that quote progressives believe in, I believe in. I just don't believe that they're demonizing, uh, you know, the Jewish people as the colonialists today and all the things they say about Jews. I certainly don't believe any of that. I lived in Israel for a number of years. I love Israel. I will always love Israel. I think Israel is demonized on the left unfairly. Uh, there's certainly enormous double standards when they talk about Israel. Um, and uh, you know, they're very committed to, as are the right-wingers, very committed to what they believe in. And um, that's why I think it's, you know, they're, they're, they, it's easy to look at a bunch of neo-Nazis and say, oh, they're her horrible people and we must, you know. But when they're, uh, you know, a bunch of college students who are not wearing armbands <laughs> and not wearing swastikas um, and not marching with uh, torches, um, as they did in Charlottesville. Uh, I think that's more difficult. I think that's a really important point that you just made. We're used to saying those people who dress that way are very anti-Semitic, but we don't think of our neighbors and colleagues who just say some comments or don't say some comments as possibly being as dangerous to what people think about Jews as those people wearing armbands. Oh, I think that's very important what you just said. Do you think American Jewish organizations are responding strongly enough to these challenges? What else can American Jewish organizations do? Well, I have to say I'm not a huge maven on, on, on this topic. I mean, I think there are many organizations that are fighting really the good fight and working uh, diligently to combat anti-Semitism. I don't know, uh, my only suggestion is to um, forge as many alliances as possible with the, uh, believe it or not, uh, Louis Farrakhan notwithstanding, with the black community, with the Latinx community, with the LGBTQ community, um, Native Americans, et cetera. I mean, uh, again, I come back to the canary in the coal, in the coal mine uh, because these, organization or these uh, groups need to understand that, um, you know, and in the case of black people, it's not that they're next, there's so much race hatred going on right now. Um, so, uh, you know, there, they could be a very potent weapon uh, alliances. There may be some already, but they could be uh, really a potent alliance uh, alliances. And the other thing is, uh, the Christian and Muslim communities. Muslim community seems far-fetched. I don't think it really is uh, because, uh, you know, Muslims are uh, the targets of a lot of hate in this country as well. And um, 
I don't know about really extreme Christians, uh, but the mainstream Christian community, I think, is by and large supportive of Israel. And um, they have, you know, enormous number of people who they could reach. So that would be my thought on that. How do we make those? I mean, without going into too much detail, my adult daughter and I, pre-COVID, just a couple of blocks away, went to a Writers Guild Foundation program. It was a program with Latino writers and showrunners about TV. And it's the first time I've ever heard anti-Semitic statements issued from the stage by two different people. There were probably five or six of the total panel. It was so shocking. And I'm sure that most people in the auditorium had no idea how anti-Semitic these comments were. And it was frightening because that showed the bridge between how we have to explain to these other communities that we were really on the same side and not enemies. So that was, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's not an easy battle. There's so much, you know, so many ideas about Jews. They're all rich, they're all powerful, they're all trying to take over the world. Right, that, uh, was, things that was like that. Um, yeah. And what gets lost in the shuffle, of course, the Holocaust is the dark cloud hovering up above all this. I, I've always been uh, haunted, as many Jews are and have been, by the Holocaust. Um, so uh, I think one of the main things is something you alluded to earlier, I believe, is to not let things pass. Um, this Egyptian woman I spoke of at the beginning, I don't think the, I don't really, you know, it's been a few years, I don't remember precisely. I don't think the interviewer really challenged that idea that Jews are the spawn of pigs and monkeys. Um, we all encounter uh, little nuggets of anti-Semitism in our daily life, whether it's someone saying, uh, oh, he Jewed me down, not uncommon. Uh, and when, you know, I've had friends say that and they claim they did, oh, they, I didn't know that was anti-Semitic. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know how you couldn't know that, but um, so I, I think one thing is to not let things like that go at the moment. That doesn't mean getting hysterical. That doesn't mean uh, being nasty, uh, combative, confrontive, but it may just mean saying, you know, when I hear things like that, it hurts my feelings. And I don't think it's justified. And um, I hope you can be aware of that. Um, so that's one thing, yeah. I, yes, I mean, one of the things that Evelyn and I do on our program is talk about the kinds of things that people can say. As I recall, I did try and reach out to do something about that particular thing, not very successfully. I actually reached out to a Jewish organization with um, a special person was supposed to work on, on Latino Jewish relations. And I think I could tell this account with that, with, without putting anyone. So the person said, oh, you know, we, we had a uh, meeting at a very top Hollywood entertainment executive's home and we talked about it. Well, that's wonderful, but that doesn't count. I tried to explain to her, I'd like to help um, do something with writers. They're the ones who write these um, scenes in TV shows. The top level exec executives do not write the scenes in the shows. And she didn't give me the time of day. And this is someone who was paid by a Jewish organization to be that, uh, whatever you call it, be liaison. So that's why I think that Jewish organizations really need to understand that you have to start at grassroots, that you cannot be so pleased. She was very pleased that who sponsored, you know, at whichever high level executive, but it means nothing unless we change the minds of the writers. So that's just my little, my right. little plant. Well, the Hollywood thing is also problematic because, you know, quote, Jews control Hollywood, they run Hollywood. Um, Overall, Jewish success, which is mind boggling, really. Um, I, I think a lot of the claims that are made about Jewish success are correct. Jews do have done great in business. They've medicine, science, 
where the anti-Semites go wrong is to claim that, the, oh, that's an indication of some big uh, plot to take over the world, rather than to say, wow, we really admire these people. We can learn from these people. So um, yeah, you know, the, at the uh, uh, event you went to, um, that's the kind of thing where someone could stand up and say, uh, I, you know, I appreciate everything you've said. I would take exception with this, et cetera. Right. And that's important. Right. The microphone was not passed to me. So that's, okay. that's the, so that's when I did follow up. But then even perhaps in other cases, people would be more successful with follow up. So what do you think individuals can do to end anti-Semitism? I mean, okay, exactly. If you can speak up at that time, if it would have been a, a small enough group, that would have been a wonderful way to have, have uh, countered that. Again, calmly, no accusations, just I feel offended. But what can individuals do in your experience? Individuals who are not willing to take risks. I mean, if someone would have let me have the microphone, I wouldn't have cared that that was in front of 200 or 300 people. But there are other people who might have, and maybe legitimately. In, in, for, to go back to that event, I mean, if there was an opportunity after it was over to approach those people, that would have been a good thing. Um, I want to take exception with your idea of ending, uh, ending anti-Semitism. It's been with us for 2,000 years. I think the, the notion that we're going to be able to end anti-Semitism, maybe when the Mashiach comes back, <laughs> comes, not comes back, comes, um, you know, anti-Semitism will end. I think our, our goal has to be uh, to ameliorate it as much as possible, to always protect the Jewish people so there's no more Holocaust, uh, and um, to do our very best to educate uh, the world about it. Um, I'm, I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to recommend a book, so uh, I'll skip this part for then, till then, but um, yeah, uh, you know, if you say end, end anti-Semitism, I think it makes people feel this is hopeless. Um, you know, it's always going to be here. There's not much we can do. There are things we can do to lessen its impact. Well, I just like what you said very much because I personally usually say combat or fight against anti-Semitism. And one of our guests, I wouldn't say corrected Evelyn or me, but said, no, no, it's to end anti-Semitism. And you're right. Ending anti-Semitism is not possible. Well, but, good, luck, good luck with that task to end anti-Semitism. But, um, but toning it down and getting people to understand, I mean, and it's so simple. Just the way you, um, this one, it, you'll think it's a, but it's not really. I'm also concerned about the Roma who were killed in the Holocaust. So when someone uses the word gypped, I correct them. It comes from the word gypsy. It is correct. as bad as any other offense. If I say, and there are so many people who have no idea what that word means, but it's, a, and I say it nicely, perhaps you don't know, but you know, I'm really the correct word, word is cheated. And uh, to me as a writer, language is very powerful. Changing people's words almost one person at a time is a way to help fight anti-Semitism. So I would like you to suggest the book now because we do wanted to talk, there are educational resources on uh, your website, anti-Semitism exposed, you, uh, uh, you have interviews with Deborah Lipstadt and other things you have, you carry Evelyn's Never Again Is Now documentary interview. What book do you want to suggest or book? Okay. I would like to suggest a book called uh, Jewish Pride. We've talked about that. And um, who is it by? It doesn't seem to be showing up on, uh, and maybe there was one more page that printed out. Anyway, I believe it's his name is Ben uh, Friedman. Let me, can you yes. hold on one sec while I make yes, sure? We interviewed him. Oh, yeah. Ben Freeman's. Freeman, yeah. Uh, I thought it was a fabulous book. I just read it a short while ago. So uh, that's, I'm sure, available at Amazon or elsewhere. Yeah, it is. Um, as you say, I mean, my uh, websites uh, have a lot of resources. By the way, I just want to emphasize they're .org, not .com. 
Yes. Did I? Um, see? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, on the anti-Semitism exposed at the bottom, there's a one section called uh, uh, "Never Again." There's a never forget and there's a never again. And never again is often has, you know, things that would be useful in the fight against anti-Semitism. By the way, what you said earlier, I certainly agree with. The tagline on antisemitismexposed.org is uh, knowledge is power to overcome hate. So that's really key. And, and it's not just this book. I mean, there's many terrific books uh, that people can read to, uh, you know, educate them about this issue. I recently read the book Jews Don't Count by uh, an English um, Jew, David Baldio, I think is how you say his uh -huh. name. And, and it's right, uh, you know, people can say offensive things about Jews that they would never say about other groups, but it's not considered offensive. So it's a small book. If people want to read a short book. Yeah, I know, I know about the book. I haven't read it yet. And now I'm reading uh, a woman who has a really interesting project in Belarus, uh, Deborah Brunner. It's called the togetherplan.org, which I just spoke to her. It's really interesting Jewish heritage in Belarus. She recommended this book, maybe you know, On Tyranny. Look how small it is, it's teeny, I just got it. 20 Lessons from the 20th Century by Timothy Snyder. It's like teeny, I got it on Amazon. And, and again, it's really, good explanation in a way for giving us understanding of how we can respond. So yeah, I, I would say that any books that you think are worthwhile, please email me about them and I'll try to put them on the website because there is a book section. Oh, good. And I have on my, uh, my thin edge of the wedge.com books, but those books are not these kinds of books. They're strictly about history. So I have them by country and by subject, like, uh, uh, you know, saviors, so that kids, students doing projects about the Holocaust and look up and say, I want to know something about country X. So I don't actually, although I keep a list of these books for my own use, on my website, it's all about history. So on your site, it's much more the kinds of books that could help people today. Although I think everyone should well, know. History is, you know, actually, I do have a section called... Um, history, I think, on anti-Semitism exposed. And I go back to, you know, sadly, various massacres and uh, expulsions. And uh, I mean, there's unfortunately no shortage of this kind of material. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, send me, or I'll, what was your, the website I should look at again? The website is thinedgeofthewedge.com. Thin Edge of the Wedge? It's a British expression, thin edge of the wedge, it gets bigger. No one says oh, it gets yeah. bigger, bigger, bigger. Until I will definitely look at it for some you know, book ideas. Yeah, so on the right-hand sideboard, uh, side part, one of the things is a nonfiction Holocaust reading list. So what would be the one thing that you would ask American Jews to, to do today to combat anti-Semitism? What's the simplest thing we could do? I would say it's to become as active as possible in the Jewish community and as active as possible with the Jewish organizations that are fighting anti-Semitism. Um, you don't have to be religious to do that. You don't have to be a believer to do that. You just have to care about uh, the Jewish people, your children, your grandchildren, and their futures. Um, I think that would be invaluable. And um, as I said earlier, the, also uh, don't let these things pass. I mean, if someone says to you, he jewed me down uh, in a calm way, calm way, we always a have hateful way, explain how that makes you feel. Um, you know, I know the thing about Jip that that's short for gypsy. That's not really good. Uh, how someone could not understand that to Jew someone is not exactly, or to Jew, Jew me down is not exactly uh, a, an inoffensive, uh, com, you know, use of words. Uh, I don't understand, I, you know, people just uh, are, some people are just ignorant. I met a, a, a non-Jewish woman who never knew that Einstein was Jewish. Interesting. M amazing, <laughs> amazing. Very. Um, this so, is the, go, go ahead. You, you get your last chance, any last thoughts? Okay, if you will indulge me in a very quick plug. Yes, I go ahead. Everyone will visit amazingjews.org, antisemitismexposed.org, 
and amazingisraelis.org. I hope everyone will sign up for our free e-updates when we have, we frequently put on all new content, so you'll be getting an update. I encourage you to go to the website. And finally, if you find it in your means and, and your desire to help support the, this effort, uh, which I'm mainly supporting out of my yeah. own pockets, not too deep pockets, uh, and make a contribution in any amount, that would be greatly appreciated. And it's very easy to do on the websites. Okay. So with that, I want to thank you so much, Lenny. This has just been a wonderful discussion. And thanks to our listeners for listening. Do check out Evelyn Marcus's documentary, Never Again Is Now. It's, you can go to joinneveragainisnow.com and you will uh, have free access to it. And you can go to my website, thinedgethewedge.com and have free access to all my materials. And whenever you can, without getting beaten up, so calmly and maturely, speak up against anti-Semitism. Thank you.